my God. In thee do I place my trust. Let me never be ashamed, for let thy will be done. Into your hands, O Lord, do I commit my spirit that your will would be done. Where you find unrest, give peace to my spirit. And where you find uncertainty, give wisdom to your servant. O oh Lord, bless us to be sensitive to the leadings and promptings of the Holy Spirit yeah. and make our hearts receptive soil and fertile ground so that the good seed of the gospel might take root, leaving us all challenged, convicted, and changed. Now, O oh Lord, take my hand, lead me on, let me stand. But thy will be done, O oh Lord, thy will be done. In the holy and sacred name of Jesus, we pray and ask it all, amen. <coughs> To God the Father, Christ the Son, to the Holy Spirit, to the pastor of this church, my friend and brother, Pastor Blake Wilson, and then to you, you and you, good morning. This past month has been a trying time and season in the life of our country and community. A lot has been said, the matter of why are they killing our men has been addressed. The importance of being one's brother's keeper. In the midst of all of this, there's a backdrop that I don't want us to forget. It's something that we need to be mindful of in keeping with those themes during times of trial. If you would join me in Psalm 23. David is writing at some undesignated time of his life when he too is dealing with trouble. And yet, ironically, he writes an up-tempo, optimistic song in the midst of trying circumstances. Psalm 23, when you have it, say amen. And the text reads, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not walk. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I want to talk briefly from the subject, the shepherd of the psalm. The shepherd of the psalm. How do you know God? It is a question that assumes that God is knowable. It is a question that assumes 
relationship. Being interrogative, there are some investigation is required as there are many ways in which God is known. To some, he is known historically as the sovereign deity of Abraham and Judeo-Christian faith. To some, he is known scientifically as the unprovable theory. To others, he's known figuratively as the unavoidable character in the narrative of life. Still, to most, he is known vicariously as the God of a devout parent or devoted spouse. And yet, while these blurred associations pacify some, for the Christian, the experience of knowing God is more than a mere acquaintance. It is akin to a caregiver knowing a patient, a child knowing a parent, a congregation knowing their pastor. In his book, Knowledge of the Holy, A.W. Tozer writes that what comes into our mind when we think about God is the most important thing about us. In that statement, Tozer concludes that central to the life of the believer is not just how God knows you, but how you know God. With that said, the question I wish to raise and that the Holy Scripture will answer is this. Why do we need to know and have a relationship with the shepherd of the psalm? With the help of the Holy Spirit, we begin to find our answer at verse 1 where David begins by describing who he is to those who know him. David opens verse 1 by says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Anyone conversing with Psalms will note the various depictions of the Lord God. In Psalm 3, he is a shield about me. In Psalm 14, he is refuge from the wicked. In Psalm 54, he is the sustainer of my soul. And in Psalm 110, he is the divine warrior. And yet, of all the metaphors that David could use to describe his relationship with God, he will choose the most intimate, descriptive, and personal imagery of God of the day, the image of shepherd. David knew something about what it meant to be a shepherd. After all, when Samuel was sent by the Lord to God to anoint him, he was out in the field shepherding his father's flock. But David also knew what it meant to be a sheep. He had seen fear in the face of his older brothers before the Philistine champion, Goliath. He had seen the disappointing and tragic fate of King Saul. And he had survived enough near-death experiences of his own to know that all sheep need the shepherd. More than the metaphor, however, the intriguing distinction in this psalm is David's use of the personal pronoun, my. David says, the Lord is my shepherd. One of the greatest joys of my life was to hear my sweet daughter say, Dada, for the first time. What made it special was that I knew that she no longer saw me as some obscure figure tending to her every whim, but now I was recognized as a loving father who cared for her every need. Likewise, for David, the Lord is not celebrated here as some unknowable abstract benefactor, but as his personal Savior and shepherd. Martin Luther famously said that the heart of religion lies in its personal pronouns. In a marriage, a well-loved wife will say, that's my husband. A well-cared-for child will boast, that's my father. And likewise, the Christian ought to make their boast as David does, that the Lord God is my shepherd. This is no longer the boast, however, of many. The old, distractive, and destructive, and idolatrous nature of humanity has circled around again in this present day. We heard it just two weeks ago. 
The most tragic evidence, evidence of this can be seen not merely in society, but also in the church's descent into a pleasure pursuit and a self-centered dogma. It is a detestable time and a damning doctrine that mistakes man and his pleasures for God's goal and reason for living. Today, being blessed is popular, but servitude of the gospel is unattractive. Today, gifts are greater than the giver. Money is preferred over the maker, clothes over the creator, and commodities over Christ. But David is compelled by the Holy Spirit to remind us that what cash can't cure, what clothes can't cover, and where commodities and accoutrements are no comfort, that the one thing that we all need most is a relationship with the shepherd. And his name is Jesus Christ. And David expounds on his goodness for those who know him when he says, I shall not want. A family went on a five-day vacation, failing to make arrangements for greedy, their Peruvian Inca, they left a week's worth of dog food out to satisfy him. Being a dog, he acted out of nature. He was simply being himself. And so being a dog, he ate a week's worth of dog food in a matter of hours. Because of his insatiable appetite, he literally ate himself to death. How many of us are living with uncontrolled, unchecked, and insatiable appetites only to discover that we have a craving for things that cannot fill us? John D. Rockefeller, the early 20th century oil baron and billionaire, was once asked, how much money is enough? And he said, just a little bit more. Those who have not found God always find themselves in pursuit of one more. One more car, one more cruise, one more condo, one more relationship. But David teaches us that in God alone, we find complete and total fulfillment. Someone here this morning, you're unhappy. The problem is you keep seeking out joy and fulfillment in possession or personalities. And every time a relationship fails, you don't blame you. you it, you're not at fault. It's always the last man or woman you were with. But that's because you failed to realize that total and complete fulfillment in life can only be found in a relationship with God the Father that is realized through Jesus Christ the Son by the power of the Holy Spirit. Well, Jasper Williams famously calls God a blank check. David, I say that because David teaches us that in God alone we find this completeness, and in the Hebrew it reads this, I shall want no other God. David could mean I want no other God, or he could mean I want for nothing. Still, I believe the text implies both, that to have God is to have no other need. A little girl was asked by her father to recite the 23rd Psalm. She said, the Lord is my shepherd, I want no more. Again, Jasper Williams calls him a blank check, that God is whatever you need him to be whenever you need him to be it. If you're hungry, he's manna from heaven. If you're thirsty, he's water from a rock. If you're sick, he's a great physician. And if you're lonely, he's a friend who sticks closer than a brother. Simply put, David is teaching us that fellowship with God is the end of all needs. Verse 1 is the thesis of the 23rd Psalm. The preceding verses, David qualifies what he says in verse 1 in verses 2 through 6. And so we see here again, fellowship with God is the end of all needs. And this is who he is to those who know him. The divine, loving, benevolent, benevolent life-giver king, Jesus the Christ. But then David shifts in verse 2 and 3. He's shown us who he is to those who know him. Now he shifts to show us what he does for those who trust him. Verse 2 says, he makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. 
Here, David delves into the character of God. Where some read this psalm and focus on the provisional needs of the sheep, the psalm focuses on the loving qualities of the shepherd. Read the emphasis again in the text. He makes, he leads, he restores. This is what God does for those who trust him. When the leprous Naaman was told by the prophet Elijah to go and dip down in the river Jordan seven times to be healed, he had to trust him. When a woman who had suffered for 12 years with an issue of blood pressed her way through a crowd to but touch the hem of his garment, she had to trust him. And when you and I heard the foolishness called preaching, for those who are saved and we believed in the gospel, you and I made a decision on that day for our soul salvation to trust him. But more impressive than the green pastures and the still waters that David speaks of is the, is the shepherd's ability to introduce us to them. The text says, he makes me lie down in green pastures. This is not a minor chord in the psalm that would be negative, a dry dirge, if you will. This is still a major chord. The entire psalm is an upbeat. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. This is not the negative imagery of a God who forces you down to the ground, puts his foot on your neck to make you succumb and enjoy green pastures. No, that is not what David is painting. In the Hebrew, it translates this way, he makes it possible. David says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Literally, he makes it possible for me to lie down in green pastures. He points out the provisional capacity of a sovereign God. And this is what God does for all of us. From pulpit to pew, he makes things possible. The keeping of your family, he makes it possible. Your recovery from sickness, he makes it possible. Your pursuit of education, he makes it possible. Owning your own business, he will make it possible. And above everything else, your salvation, he made it possible. There's a huge theological term for this. It's called grace. You do know what grace is, don't you? Grace is the unmerited, undeserved favor of God. It is God doing for us that which we cannot do for ourselves. It is God working and interceding on, on our behalf as people, not only and always with us, but thank God in spite of us. From there, he, David says he restores my soul. Moffat in his commentary translates this verse, he revives life in me. What the food of the pasture does for my hunger, what the still waters do for my thirst, only the shepherd can do for my soul. Some think that for their revitalization, they need shopping, sleep, substance, socials, or sex. But what we all need is him. For only God can restore your soul. And David says that when I am restored, he takes me up again and he leads me in the path of righteousness. He keeps us from the paths of life that would otherwise cause us to stray, the path of rebellion and destruction. He guides, he says, because no sheep can guide itself and neither can a Christian. E. Stanley Jones was once lost in the jungles of India in order to get back to civilization, he hired a local tribesman to lead him back. For many hours, they cut through bush and vine. Growing impatient, Dr. Jones asked, Sir, where is the path? The guide glanced over his shoulder and replied, Sir, I am the path. And this is what David affirms about the shepherd of the psalm, that for those who trust him, he not only guides me in the path of righteousness, but Jesus Christ is the path of righteousness. He said of himself, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Well, what motivates his care and diligence? David says in the psalm, it's for his namesake. Read verse 3. When I was a child, my grandmother, Jean Harris, believed in sending my cousin and I out in clean clothes, particularly if it was anything white, like our socks or maybe a T-shirt. She was very adamant. If it was white, it was supposed to be white. 
She bleached everything. My other grandmother, whenever she would take me to a friend's house or to the YMCA or somewhere, if she were dropping me off, she would always say the same thing. The very first day of every school year, now baby, don't act no fool. The reason for this is that both of my grandmothers were not only guarded about my cousins and I's appearance and guarded about our conduct, they were also guarded about their reputation. And just as I was a reflection of my grandparents and how I looked and behaved, sheep are a reflection of the shepherd. And that's why everything that God does for us for, as believers, he does for us for his namesake. There's another word for it. It's a huge word. It's called glory. And everything he does, God's own glory is his chief motivation. That's why everything that good that happens that comes your way, as the Bible says, every good and perfect gift comes from the Lord. You ought to give God the glory for everything right that happens to you. And this is what he does for those who trust him. In verses 2 and 3, we see the impact of his name. Because of his name, he leaves us well rested from where we've been laying. Because of his name, we have no thirst by the still waters where, where he's been leading. Because of his name, our soul is alive and restored. Because of his name, our paths are righteous from where he's been guiding. And we have assurance because of his vowing. All of this is for his namesake. And yet with all of these affirming experiences, there are two sudden shifts in the text. First, the psalmist, David, moves from talking about the shepherd to talking to the shepherd. And when we talk about God, we ought to interrupt our own conversation at some point and start talking to God. David teaches us here that we need to always stir more prayer into the stew of our theology. But then secondly, the writer takes us from green pastures and still waters and righteous paths through the darkest valley. Here, David tells, shows us where he is for those who need him. Look at verse 4 and 5. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. David is now playing to a historical point in his own life. He is speaking out of a personal experience during a troubling time. In German, the word is referred to as the Sitzenleben, the setting in life. Yet no one knows the real account of the writing of the 23rd Psalm. Is this David successfully playing the fool while hiding out in Gath amongst the foes of Israel? Or is this David as a grieving father agonizing over the unfortunate corruption of his son Absalom? Still, perhaps this is David who after more than a decade of evading and, and running from the envious and titular King Saul has grown weary of running and yet at every turn looms death. Still, perhaps this is David in the cave of Abdullah, uncertain even after his calling and anointing. Wherever he is, David pins these words. He says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. You and I can relate to David that all of us know something about the valley of the shadow of death. As a black male in America, when I get in my car every time to go up and down the highways with no felony, no criminal record, I've learned that it means nothing for my safety. Each time I'm there driving through the valley of the shadow of death, my humanity disregarded from the very beginning, labeled constitutionally as three-fifths human, denoting value. I never let it be lost on me that Martin Luther King Jr. was a preacher. He had a PhD, no criminal record, was nonviolent, and he was killed wearing a suit. Again, you and I can relate to David in the valley of the shadow of death. We all can accept our own accidents. We can deal with our own dilemmas. We can endure our own enemies. But our strength and courage will often flee in the face of the shadow of death. 
in part because the imagery is often more terrifying than reality, even gruesome. You've been there in your own life, in the valley of death, passing through the deep ravines of life where the image of the shadow was foreboding, worse than the reality. In the valley, you don't see the terror, but you see its shadow. You don't see divorce, but you see its shadow. You don't see layoff, but you see its shadow. You don't see unemployment, but you see its shadow. You don't see sickness, but you see its shadow. You don't see a son lost to violence, but you see its shadow. You don't see a teenage daughter lost to pregnancy, but you see its shadow. And yet, what well, the writer tells us, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, he says, I fear no evil. On the passport of the people of God is the seal of the cross, and it reads, fear not. When the angel Gabriel appealed to Mary, and told her to fear, he told her to fear not, when, another angels, when other angels would meet the shepherds in the field to announce the birth of Messiah, their first words to them would be, fear not. And when he came walking across the trembling sea while his disciples were on a boat that he himself had placed them on and sent them ahead, they got nervous, panicked, and trembled because they thought it was a phantasm or a ghost. And Jesus uttered to them, fear not. And when he appeared in a room with his disciples while the door was shut, he said to them first, fear not. Here David says, I walk through and I fear no evil. David, why do you fear not? Because just as the shadow of a sword can't cut you, just as the shadow of a beast can't harm you, just as a shadow of a boxer can't hit you, the shadow of death can't kill you. And David says, the reason I have my confidence and know this is because you are with me. Only one person in life can walk with you through the darkest valley and bring us out safely on the other side. And he is the shepherd of the psalm, the life giver king, the begotten of the father, Jesus the Christ. Someone has said that he's a very present help in a time of trouble. And this is where he is for those who need him. He is there in the midst of your situation and circumstance. And I don't know who I'm talking to this morning, but somebody you woke up this morning with trouble on your mind. You got in your car, pressed your way to church because you were burdened by some circumstance, some news from the doctor, some, some, some troubled child, a fractured, frustrated marriage, maybe some turbulence on your job. But I want you to know you might feel alone, but you are not alone if you are saved then you are a sheep of the Most High God, and the shepherd is always with you, even if you can't see him or sense him. David says, the Lord is my shepherd. Indifferent to my reality, the Lord is my shepherd. Well, wherever David is in life, he has come to know and now shares with us that wherever state you find yourself in, whether it's in the pasture or in the palace, whether in the valley or on the summit, mm -hmm. on the run or in pursuit, the shepherd is always with his sheep. And the good news is in the life of the believer that David says again, his boast is thou, thou art with me. He's present. And in verse 5 we learn he's not empty-handed. David says, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. The Palestinian shepherd normally carried these two instruments. The rod was for protection and the staff was for direction. With these two, the Lord is able to protect, corral, guide, and redirect would-be wandering sheep because shepherds lead from behind, giving them the advantage of a panoramic view over the flock. Then David says, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Again, you and I can relate to David when he speaks of God blessing in the presence of enemies. 
All of us have lived through times when you were surrounded on all fronts. You had sickness to your left. You had bills to your right. You had enemies behind you, uncertainty before you, and evil all around you. And yet God prepares and provides for the needs of his own, and he does so even in the presence of your enemies. We as a people know something about God blessing in the face of prejudice, jealousy, and self-inflicted hate. When Abraham Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation, January 1, 1863, it was in the presence of his enemies. When Lyndon Baines Johnson issued, signed the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and 65, he did so in the presence of enemies. And when President Barack Obama took office, the oath of office for the first time, January 20, 2009, it happened in the presence of many boastful enemies. But can I tell you that 2,000 years ago, stepping out of a bald man's tomb, Jesus got up with all power from the grave, and he did so despite his enemies. And he has a motive behind it because the, in the presence of your enemies, he offers blessing and abundance. The anointing is a sign of blessing, and the cup overflowing is a sign of abundance. Here, perhaps, David is recalling the initial anointing of his own life. But more than the anointing, David is grateful for the anointer. Here, the blessing in the presence of your enemies is meant as much for them as it is for you. Because God's goal is always the redemption of a lost, fallen, and dead humanity. In other words, in his blessing and bounty, the Lord God shows the kind of shepherd he is for, for you to know and for others to see. And that's why it's a true saying, if you want to be blessed, you need to get you some haters. There's some, there's some truth to that. There's some sound theology to that. Because, see, when people get after you, when people antagonize you, when people with nothing more than an evil, wicked, and ungodly motive seek to destroy and undermine you, God in his holiness is motivated because of his believer to bless you so they can see the kind of God he is. I read somewhere that I've never seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed beg for bread. Well, we've seen who he is in verse 1 to those who know him. In verses 2 and 3, we see what he does for those who trust him. In verses 4 and 5, we see where he is for those who need him. And now in verse 6, we see what becomes of those who serve him. At his height in verse 6, David rises to the crescendo of the Psalms when he says, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. In life, there are many things that follow us. Our medical records, they follow us. Criminal records follow us. Academic records follow us. Overall, our reputation follows us, sometimes doing harm to us. But for David, all of the blessings of verses 1 through 5 flow out of God's prevailing tendency, the dominant motivation of his heart, and the cause goodness and mercy to follow us. This verb, follow, is used everywhere else in Scripture in a hostile sense. The fact that it's given a benevolent touch makes its usage more striking. In the Hebrew, it translates, it means one who runs after, to track as a hunter, to stalk. In other words, God, David says, surely goodness and mercy. Now, goodness here in the Hebrew is a synonym for grace. So David is literally saying, God has dispatched grace and mercy to stalk me all the days of my life. Mm. Let me explain in case you can't appreciate this verse. When David says, surely goodness and mercy shall stalk me, follow me all the days of my life, understand that grace and mercy are twins with two unique functions. Grace is the first twin. Grace is always in front of you. Grace serves as your valet. Grace lifts things that are too heavy for you to lift. Grace fixes things too complicated for you to fix. 
Grace massages the hearts of those who would otherwise mistreat you. When a door is closed to you, grace just picks the lock and opens the door up to you. That's what grace does. Mercy is always behind you. Now, mercy follows you with a mop and a bucket because mercy comes behind you because along the way of life, you are going to make mistakes. And while grace is opening up doors and opportunities, while you're making mistakes in your humanity, mercy says, I got it, just keep on moving. Don't worry about that relationship. That drug addiction, alcohol problem, unemployment, bad attitude, cussing everybody, lying on everybody, sleeping with everybody. Whatever your vice is, God, if you're saved, has dispatched mercy to follow you all the days of your life. Don't let nobody throw your past in your face like you not somebody new. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 tells us, they that are in Christ are new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And when all things have become new, it's not just you entering into newness, it's newness entering into you. Well, he doesn't just pursue us, but he pursues us with the prize of eternity. David says, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. This does not indicate a temple or church. That's not what David is talking about. David is now talking about his own mortality and his eternal conviction and experience. And so he lets us know here that beyond this life, there's a life that God has for me to dwell with him. Jesus himself said, I go and prepare a place for you. From the beginning, David sought to extol and give praise to, to God, whom he knows personally. And in doing so, he draws our attention away from the psalm and rejects, re redirects it to the shepherd. A famous English atheist and poet was a part of the orator's contest. As one of the two finalists, this erudite, affluent, atheist, poet, was given the opportunity to pick the final poem that he would read or quote. Though an atheist, he oddly enough appreciated the flow, the symmetry, the beauty of the 23rd Psalm. He came before the people, well-dressed and erudite, and he began to recite the 23rd Psalm. When he was through, the crowd stood to their feet, applauded, celebrated. People whistled, hooped, and hollered. He went back to his seat very proud and cocky and sat down, crossed his legs, lit a cigar. The other finalist was a young, unassuming preacher. The chief judge said, now, we'll go ahead and let the young man go, but I, I don't know how he's going to compete with that. We know who the winner is. The scorecards had already been set up. The young man came in and he began to recite the 23rd Psalm. He said, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes it possible for me to lie down as unworthy as I am. He leads me in the path of righteousness. He restores my soul. All of this for his name's sake. And even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, strangely, I fear no evil. Because he's with me. And he's got his rod and his staff, and they comfort me. He prepares a table before me lowly and low down me in the presence of my enemies. He, he anoints my head with oil. He makes my cup, as bad as I am with money, overflow. <laughs> Surely goodness and mercy will follow me 
all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. When the young man finished, there came no applause, and no one stood. There was only to be found tears in every eye. The chief judge could not restrain himself. He jumped up, and he said, that's it. The young man is the winner of the orator's contest. The atheist was outdone. He's educated, erudite. He got up, wait a minute. The young man stumbled. He had poor elocution, poor pronunciation. He jumbled up the order. How is it possible that he beat me in the orator's contest? The judge wiping tears from his eyes. He said, sir, you're right. In every conceivable way, you were better. You showed us that you know the song, but he showed us he knows the shepherd. Again, as the Holy Bible has stated, we must know him in person, through provision, by protection, and because of his promise. For the thesis of verse 1, and throughout it qualifies to the rest of the psalm, and you remember our question at the very beginning, why do we need to know and have a relationship with the shepherd of the psalm? If you forget everything else I've said, you remember this. The text is tailored to teach us that the shepherd is our salvation. Adam was redeemed. Because the shepherd is our salvation. The thief on the cross is remembered because the shepherd is our salvation. Peter was restored because the shepherd is our salvation. Thomas was reclaimed because the shepherd is our salvation. Paul was recruited because the shepherd is our salvation. Sin and Satan have been rebuked because the shepherd is our salvation. Crossover is established because the shepherd is our salvation. And your salvation, your marriage, your children, your health, everything good about your life, and even when it's not good, all the more so the shepherd you need to know is our salvation. I'm taking my seat, but I have one question that you need to really think about on today. Today. Do you know the shepherd for yourself? I'm taking my seat, but his presence is real. His power is impacting. His provision is enough, and his love is everlasting. Herod couldn't kill him. Pilate couldn't convict him. Death couldn't stop him. The grave couldn't hold him. I can't resist him, and you can't make me doubt him. Jesus, the life-giver king. Jesus, Mary's baby. Jesus, the good shepherd. Jesus, the bright and morning star. To know him is to love him. To love him is to serve him. And to serve him is to see him. And all I want to see him, look upon his face. There to sing forever of his saving grace. On the streets of glory, let me lift my voice. Cares all pass. Home at last. Hey, hey, ever to rejoice.